Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and support our new movement by putting Let's Go Viral in the comment section. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review. But without further ado, here are your hosts, Nicely Chunga Benny and Greg King. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast, members of the Off the Ball Network. And in today's episode, we're going to be breaking down Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals. Going to be talking about what worked for Boston and what didn't work for Miami, and maybe highlight some of the things that they can look forward to coming in the near future and things of that nature. But before we get started with today's episode, if you guys are new to our YouTube channel or you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any other podcast streaming platform, Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe on our YouTube page. Turn on post notification and give us a five-star rating and a nice review on all our podcast streaming platforms. But with that being said, let's get started with today's episode. Had a great game seven last night. You know, very highly anticipated matchup, Boston versus Miami. This one was for all the marbles. That being said, understandably, Boston came into this game with a lot of defensive energy, right? It started on the defensive end in the half court setting. You know, they were able to get a lot of stops against Miami's half court offense. And, you know, they was able to ignite a lot of transition offense for them individually, staying away from the half court setting from their perspective, right? You know, they had 13 points in transition baskets in the first quarter. And ironically, they didn't get many transition opportunities after that. But that first quarter, if you're a Miami Heat stand, you can look at that first quarter and think, had we just, you know, been a little bit more adequate offensively instead of scoring 17 points being held to, you know, low scoring in the first quarter, maybe the outcome of this game looks a little bit different because Boston, towards the bottom of the quarter, they have a tough time in terms of, you know, just executing and keeping their foot on the gas. You know, this is a relatively young team led by players that are under the age of 27 years old. So you tend to see some of those young tendencies kind of come out of a team like that but you know with that being said i mean they got pretty adequate production from their bench guys like Derek white was able to step up robert williams although you know he was a little bit hobbled still was a little bit of a presence out there you could tell that you know his shot blocking ability was able to alter some of the decisions that miami made at the rim tonight and Let's talk about Miami because there's a number of things that I wanted to point out in this series that I feel like unacknowledged by, you know, some of the talking TV heads. Defensively, for the majority of the series, Miami was great. I mean, they did a great job in terms of disguising most of their defensive coverages. I'm talking about, you know, going boxing one, falling into a matchup zone, going into man to man. And, you know, it was really tough for guys like Jason Tatum to be a consistent playmaker in this series because... Jason Tatum, you know, he has the tendencies of, you know, hitting the throwback options out of the pick and roll. He likes to identify the guys in a short roll options, whether it's, you know, uh, Al Horford, you name it, or Robert Williams on a lob pass in the dunker spot, right? But Miami, for the entirety of this series, they did a great job in terms of taking away the middle penetration. You had guys boxing one falling into a 3-2 zone or a matchup zone. And basically, not only just eliminating middle penetration, But defensively, when they're in these zone coverages, the bottom guys on the Miami Heat, on the strong side of the floor, they will hug up towards the free throw line area, continuing to to apply pressure and taking away those driving lanes and their clear cut angles all the way to the basket. That way, forcing not only the ball out of the ball handler's hands, but, you know, also making that skip pass or that one pass away to the corner a little bit more difficult. So, you know, you saw Tatum accumulate a few turnovers that way. And Jalen Brown, you know, he had the tendencies of dribbling into those types of defensive coverages all series. But all in all, you know, Miami, they did a really good job. If you're a Miami Heat fan, you got to be really proud of this team because, you know, they just did a really good job in terms of, you know, their effort and just being able to maximize the overall talent that they had, which we all understand, you know, kind of similar to the Dallas Mavericks and the opposing side of the Western Conference. There was a huge talent deficit between, you know, those two teams, right? And I think, you know, Miami was similar in that sense. That being said, well-coached series by Eric Spolster. I thought Eric Spolster out-coached Ime Udoka for the entirety of this series. And he may, the defensive coverages that he's going to have to implement in the following series, their things must be a little bit different. For the entirety of this series, I was always wondering, okay, why is Al Horford sitting in the drop coverage for 48 minutes? Same thing with Robert Williams. I think the majority of the reason why they were able to do that, especially in the second half of the series, was because the Tyler Hero injury. Typically, you know, he's a guy that's going to punish, you know, defensive coverages like that. And, you know, with Miami just struggling in the half court overall, not really having any consistent scoring outside of Jimmy Butler, Celtics were able to get away with those defensive coverages, right? Obviously, they're not going to be able to get away with drop coverage against Stephen Curry and the Golden State Warriors. That's going to cause a lot of offensive avalanches, right? And if you're Boston, you don't want to dig yourself a hole. 
But the more talented team won tonight. The more talented team won tonight. There's a few questions on Miami's end that they need to be answered by the end of the offseason, in my opinion. I want to start out with talking about Duncan Robinson's contract. You know, he's got $74 million left on his contract. And this is a guy that, you know, giving you marginal production over the last couple of seasons, right? You know, he's still a pretty adequate shooter from outside, but, you know, come postseason, he just becomes a liability. His outside shooting can't combat the fact that, you know, he's a liability defensively. And, you know, they just cannot afford to put him on the basketball court in long stretches because, you know, he just doesn't have the ability to, you know, stay on the floor and be a plus rather than a minus on the defensive side of the basketball. And I think, you know, next year, given the fact that this is a guy that's gonna be old 17, 18 million dollars on the average over the next four seasons, and he hasn't really been great since I would say probably the bubble from a postseason standpoint. You know, if I'm Miami, I would look to probably move him in a package deal, maybe that also includes guys like Kyle Lowry because he's looked like he's lost a step. You know, he's no longer a member of that Toronto Raptors team that, you know, had guys like not only Kawhi Leonard, who could cover up, you know, some of his deficiencies as an offensive threat, but, you know, Pascal Siakam or Fran Vedden Vliet, all of those guys were able to, you know, kind of shield some of the load offensively. And, you know, Kyle Lowry, he just cannot be a number two, number three option on a championship caliber team. You know, it's just not going to work. And we saw Miami kind of hit their ceiling in this series from an offensive perspective, just in terms of, you know, what guys like Jimmy Butler were able to produce because majority of this postseason, Boston, they were able to limit guys like Kevin Durant, Giannis and Tantacupo offensively. And I thought it was weird that Jimmy Butler was the one guy, the person who we all understandably known isn't that big of an offensive threat in comparison to, you know, other superstar players. He was the one that was able to, you know, have the most success against them um, this series, right? And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, Boston switching. Butler was able to take advantage in isolation scenarios in the short range against smaller defenders shooting over the top of them. And that was another thing that I thought was a little bit weird on Ime's part. You know, the fact that he wasn't doubling that action. And obviously, you know, Miami, they had a lot of success when he was isolating in the short corner or the mid post and Bam Adebayo was in below the dunker spot on the opposite side of the basketball because Boston typically wasn't going to be able to you know, shade over and help on those defensive coverages because Bam Adebayo, he's a lob threat, similar to a guy like Robert Williams. So I thought he should have relied on their perimeter defense. You know, I mean, you have the defensive player of the year. Go trap that. Go trap that action and, you know, just rotate over adequately. I thought some of their defensive coverages were a bit odd, honestly. And that probably also contributed to the fact that this series was able to go seven games. Outside of the injuries, obviously, we saw inconsistent starting lineups for the entire series. But, you know, all in all, Boston is finally moving on to the NBA Finals. I'm pretty excited to see that Boston Warriors matchup. I think there's going to be a lot of things that we can look at on both sides of the spectrum that both teams are going to be able to, you know, take advantage of i think boston matches up with them pretty well but you know their half court execution is going to be the deciding factor and whether or not you know they have a re legitimate chance of you know walking away with this thing holding that trophy at the end of the season but hey you guys let me know what y'all think about this here in the comment section thank you guys so much for tuning in to another short episode here on the ball fake podcast if you're new to our youtube channel or you're listening on apple Podcasts or spotify make sure to give us a five star rating like comment and subscribe turn on post notification give us a nice review on all podcast streaming platforms but besides that it's your boy nicey chungabini you're listening to the ball fake podcast and we out praise god